Well, there's, there's a very common mistake here that the, the Bank of England is making, but many outside commentators, including actually some critics of the Bank of England are making as well, which is to confuse individual prices with the overall level of inflation. So people look at the fact that food and energy prices have, have risen the most, and they conclude that overall inflation is therefore being driven by higher food and, and, and energy prices, which um, isn't really true. I mean, the, the reality is that if you to pump an enormous amount of money into the economy, it's going to show up in inflation somewhere. Welcome to the IA podcast. My name is Matthew Lesh, and I'm the Director of Public Policy and Communications here at the IA. Each week, this podcast asks a tantalizing policy question to a top political and economic thinker. Today's question, is the Bank of England overcompensating? This week, the Monetary Policy Committee once again raised the official bank rate, this time to 4.5%. This represents the 12th time in a row the bank has raised the rate and the highest level since the financial crisis. But, but now, some economists, including those on the IEA's own Shadow Monetary Policy Committee, believe further rate rises are unnecessary. To discuss the bank's decision and more generally the state of the economy, I'm excited to be joined by Julian Jessup. Julian is the IEA's Economics Fellow, an independent economist and member of the IEA's Shadow Monetary Policy Committee. Julian, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you. Julian, um, I don't think actually a lot of people have a lot of um, knowledge and background about what is the Shadow Monetary Mm. Policy Committee and what does it do? Well, it's a, it's a group of independent economists that have been meeting for, for many years uh, under the sort of umbrella of the, of the IEA. Um, and what we try and do is we sort of shadow the decisions of the Monetary Policy Committee. That, you know, we sort of pretend that we were members of that committee. What is it that we would do uh, on interest rates and, and other policy tools? Um, and as I say, we, we, we've been meeting for a long, long time. Um, you know, sometimes we agree with what the real Monetary Policy Committee is doing, but other times we disagree. And particularly over the last few years has been, you know, quite a big difference. The, the Shadow Monetary Policy Committee was you know, pretty hawkish on inflation uh, a couple of years ago, warning that all the, you know, the, the money printing and the long period of very low interest rates was likely to lead to an inflation surge. And therefore, the Bank of England should be raising interest rates sooner than it did. Obviously, that, that has been proved correct. Uh, but more recently, though, the, the committee has been you know, a bit more cautious, suggesting that there is, as you suggested, a, a risk of the, the monetary policy mit- committee going too far. Um, and I think the, the main reason why the shadow monetary policy committee has a bit of a difference from the real one um, is that we have more experience in things like monetary economics, uh, particularly a focus, as I say, on sort of monetary aggregates and the monetary side of the economy which is a bit different from the way that the Bank of England has been looking at things, particularly over the last few years. Yeah, let, let's get into that, because there is quite a fascinating distinction mm-hmm. about the, this, I suppose, the kind of uh, philosophical or theoretical basis of, of monetary policymaking. As you've said, the, the IEA's uh, monetary policy um, group has a, a very strong kind of, I suppose, monetarist, Friedmanite, perspective that, uh, you know, to the, the classic idea that pretty much inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon uh, at some, I suppose, an extreme sense. Um, can you explain what that means? And then maybe, and this is a question which I don't really have the answer to, I don't know if you do, what, if, if that's what drives the shadow monetary policy committee, what is what is the theoretical basis that's driving the actual monetary policy committee? What do they think drives inflation? Yeah, I mean, it's a good way of looking at it. I mean, the Shadow Monetary Policy Committee is a broad church. I mean, we're not all, you know, bonkers monetarists, I think. But the key point is that we we pay more attention to, to monetary variables than the, the Bank of England seems to have done. So um, the, the Bank of England's view of the economy is 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 pretty straightforward. It looks at the the balance between um, demand and supply. So, you know, when the economy is is strong, um, it thinks it has to slow growth, and when the economy is weak, it thinks it needs to to support it. But that's very much a focus on the real economy, what's happening to economic activity, um, unemployment, and so on. It doesn't seem to pay much attention to the monetary side of the economy, or even the financial side of the economy. Um, so it can get blown significantly off course, and I think they, 
you know, they, they did get things wrong over the last couple of years when they thought it was still appropriate to keep pumping money into an economy that was bumping up against um, against capacity constraints. And they, they missed all the impact that, that excess money would have on, on asset prices and more recently on, on consumer price inflation. So um, I think it's important to look at the real economy as well as monetary variables. But the, the Bank of England just, just tended to focus on this naive output gap model which is you know, particularly weak when it's so difficult to measure what productive potential is in you know, an economy that's struggling with the, the COVID shock and you know, other shocks like the energy crisis and the fallout from Brexit. Um, it's very difficult to gauge how much spare capacity there is in the economy, but you can look at the monetary aggregates and say that you know, if broad money is growing at 15 or 20% a year, then it's potentially a warning sign for inflation. And of, and of course, the, the big failure of the Bank of England was, as you've said, they weren't looking at those measures. Now, they've subsequently gone on to blame, in particular, the war in Ukraine, and I suppose to a secondary extent, um, the uh, COVID-related supply shock. But interesting that, that there hasn't really been any introspection about the failure to to realise that, that mm. risk of forthcoming inflation. It seems to be, you know, that the Bank of England doesn't seem to have a willingness to um, I don't know if they, they should apologize per se, but at least learn a lesson from that experience. Well, there's there's a very common mistake here that the, the Bank of England is making, but many outside commentators, including actually some critics of the Bank of England are making as well, which is to confuse individual prices with the overall level of inflation. So people look at the fact that food and energy prices have, have risen the most. And they conclude that overall inflation is therefore being driven by higher food and, and, and energy prices, which um, isn't really true. I mean, the, the reality is that if you sort of pump an enormous amount of money into the economy, it's going to show up in inflation somewhere. Now, as it happens, because the supply shocks have hit food and energy, that's where the inflation has showed up. Um, but if it hadn't showed up there, it would have showed up somewhere else. Uh, what's more, if, even if you strip out food and energy prices, um, underlying inflation is, is now running at, at more than 6%. So even if it was just food and energy prices in the early stages, we've got well beyond that stage. We're now at the stage where you know, inflation is much more broadly spread through the economy, which is precisely what you'd expect if you're looking at the monetary drivers rather than picking individual shocks as, as the factors behind higher inflation. Let's get onto the more specific decision-making process this week. So we've just released the, the latest minutes from the Shadow Monetary Policy Committee meeting. As you said, um, you came to view, I think six members just suggested that there should be no rise, two suggested, in fact, there should have been a cut. Now, uh, the, the Bank of England uh, went the opposite way. I think it was about six of their members said there should be a rise and, and uh, two said it should be left the same. Now, the Bank of England seems to have focused a lot on, A, their view that, in updated models, that inflation might hang around a little bit longer than they previously thought. They're also focusing in on that um, question of food inflation. They, they seem to believe that food inflation is, is going to remain high for a bit longer, and therefore another rate increase um, was necessary. Uh, what makes you think that, that they effectively got that wrong, that uh, everything is, is actually going to be fine, that another rate increase wasn't necessary? Mm. Mind you, with inflation still running at 10%. Well, I, th I think this is another trap the Bank of England is falling into, which is looking too much just at the latest one or two months data. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's ridiculous how sensitive interest rate decisions seem to be, or whatever the last month of economic numbers happen to have been. Um, I would say that you know, the banks should be far more forward looking than that. We know that it you know, changing interest rates from month to month is not going to influence what's happening at the time. It certainly will have no impact on data that's already been published. So I think there's a danger of getting sort of bogged down in the weeds of the numbers rather than looking at the at the bigger picture. Um, I think the bigger picture on inflation is, it is actually very clear, um, including on things like food prices. So, you know, the wholesale price of agricultural commodities has been falling now for, you know, up to a year. Uh, the producer prices numbers for the food sector have been falling for about six months. Um, and with the usual lags, that means that, you know, food price inflation is going to plummet um, in the UK, as it's already starting to do actually in other countries. A number of countries have already published their inflation numbers for April, including Germany, France and Spain, and they all showed food inflation dropping off. So I think there's a danger of looking backwards rather rather than forward. Um, but above all, I think the, the, the problem here is, is missing, as I say, that bigger monetary backdrop. Um, 
we've had a, a year or two now where um, you know the Bank of England has finally been raising interest rates and and also you know turning off the tap of of cheap money by reversing some of the purchases of government bonds. The so-called policy of quantitative easing has now become a policy of, of quantitative tightening. So overall, there's been a, a big tightening in monetary and financial conditions over the last year or so. Now, th this will impact on the economy with with lags, uh, particularly through things like mortgages, because you know most people's mortgages don't go up straight away uh, when interest rates rise, but they will do soon. So we're in a situation where, and the analogy I use is, is boiling a frog. Um, you, know, you keep turning up the the water and you, you don't perhaps realize until it's too late that you've actually uh turned up the temperature too much and i think that's that's the risk with the monetary policy committee that by constantly just looking at the latest month or two of data they missed the fact that there has been substantial tightening in monetary and financial conditions over the last year uh and that could risk hitting them very hard in the head uh you know tipping the economy into recession um, and by the time they respond to that, by looking at the latest monthly data, again, it's too late. So they end up over tightening and then they have to be forced into a position of cutting rates more aggressively than they should. So I personally would have voted for, for no change in rates uh, this week as a period of, of, of wait and see to gauge how um, big the impact of the monetary tightening already in the pipeline has been. And interestingly, two members of the monetary policy committee, the real one, um, would have agreed with me on that. Uh, but equally, I, I sort of do understand that, you know, with underlying inflation above six percent and official interest rates still only four and a half percent, the the bank maybe felt that a little bit more tightening was appropriate. I, I and mean, we'll come to the kind of latest GDP figures in the respect in a second as well. But of course, that they I think they also point it to the relatively tight labour market. I'm interested in a point made by one of your colleagues on the, the Shadow uh, Monetary Policy Committee, uh, Trevor Williams, who's the current chair. Um, in his, his piece he wrote for the Telegraph, he, he kind of piloted this idea that they're overcompensating, that because they made that mistake in the past, they feel a need to uh, put up interest rates even higher because they, they want to get back their credibility. And then I suppose that comes to this idea of monetary policy, you know, and, and they say this quite explicitly, not only do we, do we want to get kind of, I suppose, the facts of the matter right, we want to get the expectations right. Um, and, and to what extent do you think they're, they're playing a game about credibility and expectations um, more, more so than any kind of, I suppose, more factual data point, effectively an, an art more than a science. And, and, and then I suppose, if that is so, is is do you, do you agree with the need at some level to play that this kind of credibility game, which which um, central bankers seem to quite enjoy playing? They just think if they can anchor the expectations right, you don't get, I suppose, the wage price spiral that otherwise might risk mm -hmm. runaway inflation. So 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 where where does expectations and credibility come into this? Yeah, well, I, I think credibility and expectations are, are really really important for for any central bank. So um, I think it is right that the you know the monetary policy committee. Keeps Keeps those sorts of things uh, front and and centre, uh, and there has undoubtedly been a problem over the last year or so that they've you know constantly been predicting that inflation won't take off and that you know the, the pressures are, are only transitory and you know it's nothing to worry about Gulf. Um, so there's clearly a, a problem there when inflation has continued to, to overshoot their their forecasts. Um, I think also their communications have been frankly terrible. Um, you know, they seem to be you know, picking fights with everybody, blaming everybody else apart from themselves for higher inflation, whether that's, you know, workers or, you know, companies raising prices or, you know, whatever else it might be. So I think they do have a, a credibility problem and maybe indeed they are over over adjusting. Um, it is important that central banks have have credibility because, you know, one way that, you know, shocks like um, an increase in food and energy prices can become permanently embedded in the economy is if they get um, cemented into expectations. So, you know, people expect prices to, to rise, so they demand higher wages. Um, I'm a little bit sceptical myself about the concept of a, of a wage price spiral driving things. I think it's another example of the relative price versus overall inflation point of view. If, you know, people, um, if, if the Bank of England itself um, kept the overall growth rate of the money supply down, then increases in individual prices, whether that's energy or food or labour, couldn't drive up the overall level of inflation. So I think the wage price story is, is a little bit overdone, but um, it's undoubtedly a, a, a factor here. 
Um, and if the bank were more credible and we were more confident that inflation was going to fall to target over the next few years, then people wouldn't be demanding such big pay increases. And perhaps companies might be a bit more willing to take the hit on their margins rather than pass on the, the cost increases that they're facing. Yes, yeah, shall we go into that that point? I think as Hugh Peel made most recently, although Andrew Bailey, I think, made previous comments that he also got scolded for in the in the public mm. debate that the chair and the chief economist of um, the Bank of England, uh, also the governor and the chief economist, um, this idea that well, what we need to do is accept that people are poorer um, in real terms and perhaps not seek out such large wage increases that could drive inflation. What what do you make of uh, those kind of I suppose, if you put negatively, lectures from um, yeah. central bankers. Well, I've, I've got a little bit of professional sympathy for economists trying to talk about these things. I, I know what Hugh Pill, the uh, chief economist of the Bank of England, was, was trying to say. He, he, he was trying to say that we have to accept that we're poorer because there's been what economists call a, a terms of trade shock. In other words, you know, we are a major net importer of energy. You know, energy is is now more expensive and therefore the economy as a whole in some sense will be worse off. But um, that's about as, as sympathetic as I can be, because of course that doesn't answer the question, do we all have to be worse off? You know, could the burden there be be shared more more equally? Um, I also think he again is falling into this trap of you know, confusing relative prices with the overall level of inflation. Uh, from a free market point of view, um, prices should adjust. So, you know, if there are labour shortages in particular parts of the economy, and you know, people there are lucky enough to call for bigger wage increases, that's that's actually a good thing. You know, that encourages people to, you know, move to those sectors. Maybe get more people who are not currently active in the labour force to to come back to work. So, um, to say that you know nobody should get a pay increase, or that you know everybody should ask for a smaller pay increase really is, is basically saying the market shouldn't be allowed to work and you know we should all you know ratchet down our pay demands in order to achieve an inflation target at the end of the day is actually the bank of england's job and you know depends on the overall setting of monetary policy not the setting of any particular individual price whether as i say that's food or energy or wages it also seems just at a fundamental level kind of naive in the sense that, do, do you really think as a, a economist or central banker, you can tell people not to ask for pay rises, to not, to go yeah. against their kind of inevitable interest in, in seeking pay rise, even if, you know, you can make some, I suppose, collective argument about the implications of that for inflation, um, not being necessarily the case, as you say, but it just seems quite kind of a, a silly thing to say in that respect yeah um, and that, just... that, that applies to to companies as well as to um as well as to workers so you know companies have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders and if they see an opportunity to make a bit more money by raising prices uh, then of course they're going to do that particularly when you know lots of these companies um have actually had a very very tough few years particularly the the covid recession of of, of 2020 so of course they're going to look for opportunities to to boost their margins if they can um so just just lecturing them we're really not going to make any difference a lot of it well, is just political grandstanding i'm afraid yeah let, let's unpack that point quickly before before we, mm. we move on which is this idea that inflation is actually being driven by by greedflation that mm. it, and we've seen some articles in the guardian i, I think a, a quite senior economist at ubs wrote something about this mm. how really the key driver of inflation is profit making um, by companies. And we, we see this a lot in the particular debate about supermarkets that, mm. well, in fact, the supermarkets are just profiteering, their, their, their profit margins have remained healthy, despite um, their consumers struggling, and wholesale prices have come down. And but that it hasn't been reflected in mm. food prices. What do you make of those arguments about? Profit well, I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical, the, the hard evidence of, of, of greedflation is, is pretty weak, there has been some you know, fairly fancy analysis done, particularly by the by the European Central Bank, you know, suggesting that profit margins have risen a bit more than they normally would have done um, over the last year or so. But there's actually less evidence of, of that in the in the UK. Um, it's worth stressing that you know profit margins are always uh, you know relatively cyclical. So you know when the economy is doing better, you tend to expect you know, price uh, profits to to rise more quickly than wages. So what we're seeing at the moment is not particularly unusual. Um, to the extent there is sort of greedflation and companies doing exceptionally well, it, I think it's still limited to a number of sectors. So, you know, energy might be one example, but even then, if you look at the, the bumper profits being made by the energy companies now, they still need to be seen in the context of the big losses they made in, in 2020. 
Uh, and if there's one sector where I think the greedflation argument is probably weakest, it is actually the supermarket sector, which is, of course, super competitive. You know, I, I do wonder if, you know, some of these people um, talking about greedflation in the supermarket sector actually ever shop in, in supermarkets and they can see how, how cutthroat the competition is there. And indeed, more recently, particularly over the last few weeks, we have seen you know, supermarkets start to, to cut food prices outright. So milk, dairy products, vegetable oils, now even bread and butter prices are coming down as well. Uh, and there is you know, strong competition between the supermarkets to, to pass the, the cost savings on. Um, I think also it's worth stressing that supermarkets, you know, their, their cost is not just the cost of the food that they buy. And it's also everything else that's gone up a lot, including you know wages and and energy costs and you know property prices and all sorts of things as well. Um, so I think it's a bit harsh to say that you know, the global agricultural price of uh, coffee has fallen. So why isn't that being exactly matched in prices in the shops? So I, I, I'm pretty skeptical of the the greedflation argument. There, there probably are a few sectors where it is playing a small factor. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about the supermarket case study is the fact that the supermarkets actually, their profit margins have gone down. And that's mm. because their costs have gone up quite substantially. And, and as you've said, I think someone was making a point about bread and that the fact that the wholesale cost of wheat had gone down. But if, but if you look at the what are the, the kind of input costs to bread, or some, I think something like 90% is to do with the milling and the product and the baking and the retailing it's it's very little to do with yeah. the actual underlying wheat and and of course all those things are quite energy intensive energy mm. costs have gone up they're quite labor intensive labor costs have gone up so you wouldn't expect the prices to go down and in six cents which they will go down it, it will take some time as well you would think for the kind of lower wholesale prices to, to filter through just because yeah. a lot of them companies have contracts that um, yeah i mean the, the good news though, I, I have i have looked into this and there does seem to be a roughly six month lag between producer price inflation in the food sector and consumer prices uh producer price inflation in the food sector did start falling about six months ago so you know i'm, I'm pretty confident that, that should mean that the numbers from april onwards are going to be a lot better in the uk just as they're starting to be in other countries well, well, let's um, finish up a little bit of discussion about the other um, big uh, economic news this week, of course, which is the latest national accounts data, which showed the UK economy unexpectedly shrunk by 0.3% in March, but grew by 0.1% over the, over the quarter. Well, what, do you, what do you make of the, these these moves in in the, the GDP stats? Yeah, well, it's the it's usual monthly volatility. I mean, the, the figures for, for March itself, the 0.3% fall, was a bit weaker than I'd been hoping for. Um, but it can largely be explained away by you know the bad weather um, holding back consumer spending, and also the impact of the of the strikes, particularly in the railways and and also in the in the public sector. Um, the more recent survey evidence has has been more encouraging. So consumer confidence was quite a bit stronger in in April. Uh, the business surveys are, are recovering as well. So I wouldn't read too much into the the fall in the month on month fall in, in in March. I think the numbers for second quarter will be. Will be better um in terms of the the first quarter growth of of 0.1 percent i mean that, that uh that's still of course not a lot to to write home about um we don't want the economy to be growing by 0.1 percent a quarter we want it to be growing by more than more than 0.5 um but the one thing i will say that was at least better than better than expected so 0.1 percent growth in the first quarter compares with the forecast that the office for budget responsibility prepared for the march budget when they were expecting a contraction of 0.4%. So already the OBR's forecasts are, are out by about half a percent. And I think this is going to be very much a year of upward revisions to, to growth forecasts, not just the OBR, but also people like the IMF and the OECD have relatively pessimistic forecasts for the UK economy that are now almost mathematically impossible uh, to hit. So there will be a raft of upward revisions to to growth forecasts um but i still wouldn't get too excited as i say because we you know we should be aiming for growth of you know two percent not just you know um maybe a tenth of that so yeah we've avoided a recession but you know compared to our potential and compared to some of our peers mm. that's still pretty poor well yeah let's, let's get into that so it's less bad than it expected i suppose is 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 the general conclusion here which is the economy's uh, rather than shrinking is growing but extremely slowly um i think it's still quite start striking that um 
the UK economy is is either, depending on what we look at it, a monthly basis, smaller than it was um, pre-COVID or, or maybe 0.1% above pre-COVID levels. Now, that to me, that seems like an extremely, whichever way you look at it, is extremely depressing fact. The, the, the UK economy has had pretty much literally no growth in the last three years. And, and as you've said, at least some of the UK's competitors uh, or competitors or, or peers um, have done better. Um, is, is the UK economy on, on a pretty, I suppose, a rubbish trajectory? Are you kind of pessimistic about the state of economic growth? Um, and and it, I suppose also, you know, what is going on here? Why, why, are, we, why are we doing so badly? Yeah. Um, well, well, first of all, you, you're right to focus on the, the level of uh, GDP or economic activity compared to the, to the pre-COVID peak. Um, I know a lot of people talk about the, the strength of our growth in 2021 and 2022 when the UK was the fastest growing G7 economy, but that followed an absolutely dreadful year in, in 2020. So uh, on a quarterly basis, um, our economy is still something like 0.5% smaller. Um, than it was before the pandemic struck. And um, that's that's unusual. It's not unique, by the way. Uh, the German and, and Spanish economies are also you know, very slightly smaller now than they were, were before COVID. But plenty of other economies, including France, Italy and, and the US, have, you know, are, are steaming ahead and are doing a lot better. So, so there is a problem there. Um, I wouldn't say it, it's necessarily a, a huge problem, partly because of you know, differences in the in the data. So um, we have been better at measuring the impact of COVID and more recently the public sector strikes uh, on economic activity. So partly this is a this is a measurement difference. Um, also, the differences in the numbers actually in the bigger scheme of things are, are, are pretty small. Um, GDP is frequently revised. Um, but there is undoubtedly and some underlying problems here. So over the last decade or so, our productivity growth has been relatively poor compared to our peers. Uh, we're doing things that uh, bad things that other countries aren't doing. So, you know, raising the tax burden a lot, particularly the, the tax burden on companies, which is you know, clearly going to be weighing on on investment. Um, and we're refusing to do some of the more politically difficult stuff on the supply side, like, frankly, building more houses and uh, things that would actually boost the performance of the economy in other ways. So um, I don't think our relative performance is quite as bad, perhaps, as some of the headlines suggest, but it, it's still bad. And I think there are underlying problems there that we we need to address. We, we, we need a government that's much more willing to... Uh, to take difficult decisions, frankly, that actually boost the, the supply side potential of the of the economy, rather than just tinkering around with demand. And uh, as I say, the housing market is 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 perhaps the single best example of that. Well, on on I think that's a slightly I guess pessimistic note. Although mm. um, I suppose it does say, in a sense, that, that the UK's kind of poor economic performance is not inevitable. Uh, I think I think it was this, this debate about you know the, the the boosters or the doomsters about whether or not you think that the UK economy has to be stagnant for a long period of time because you have an aging population, um, you have all sorts of kind of, I suppose, economic headwinds. I suppose what you're saying here is there is this opportunity for, to, to, to take it more positively. The UK economy could grow when we're not at the maximum potential of economic growth. We just we don't necessarily have the right policy settings to achieve that growth. I think I think that's right. And the, the key here, as ever, is, is productivity. If we can close some of the productivity gap that's opened up over the last decade or so, uh, then that could result in a big boost for economic growth, even allowing for unfavorable demographics. Um, as it happens, though, the, the demographics look like they'll remain positive for one, at least one sense, which is continued net immigration. You know, despite all the, you know, the, the concerns about Brexit in particular, uh, people still see the UK as an attractive place to uh, to come and work and contribute to to the economy. So, you know, a flexible policy on on, on migration combined with an increase in uh, the productivity of the local workforce, if I can, if I can put it like that, um, could still produce some some pretty decent growth numbers um, over the next decade or so. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Julian. Jessup, uh, IEA Economics Fellow, for joining us for this um, fascinating IEA uh, podcast. If you are enjoying the podcast, please do subscribe on your chosen podcast provider, or you can also find the IEA podcast on YouTube. Uh, we can also say if you want to learn more about the IEA and our work and our research, you can visit iea.org.uk.
Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.